Okay, uh, thank you. And thanks to the organizers uh, for the invitation to speak. So uh, the organizers asked me to uh, give a brief overview of uh, dark matter, particle dark matter in the beginning of the talk. Um, so there is a talk uh, on dark matter in astrophysics right after this. Uh, so I'll focus on particle dark matter in uh, cosmology. And uh, as we all know, cosmology constrains uh, some properties of the dark matter phase space distribution function and its uh, total mass density. And uh, based on our current understanding from observations, uh, we know that dark matter interacts uh, with itself and with the standard model particles through gravity only. There is of course uh, upper bounds on other interaction strengths. We also know from uh, considerations in uh, structure formation that the free streaming length for collisionless dark matter should be less than around 100 kiloparsec. And uh, if it is uh, collisional, then uh, the corresponding number is for the genes length. There are many models for particle dark matter. Uh, their primary role is in trying to understand the dark matter density through uh, dynamical processes in the early universe. So that's where the particle physics mainly comes in. So therefore, a uh, natural uh, starting point in particle dark matter discussion is its production mechanism in the early universe. Now, it is challenging to study dark matter production in the early universe uh, primarily because the history of the early universe before a photon temperature, uh, so at photon temperatures larger than an MeV is unknown, right? So from Big Bang nucleosynthesis considerations, we know that the universe had a temperature of about an MeV, but whether it had a temperature higher than that is uh, not known. Uh, if of course we uh, think that there was an epoch of inflation, which preceded the radiation dominated era, then the relevant quantities are the Hubble scale during inflation and the reheat temperature, both of which are also unknown. Of course, there is an upper bound on the inflaton energy density at the end of the slow roll, and there is a lower bound on the reheat temperature that we just mentioned. So given this uncertainty about the early universe uh, cosmology, we therefore have a very broad range of possibilities uh, that are open uh, and they have varying degrees of testability, right? And we shall only discuss a few of them uh, in today's talk. And in choosing uh, specific examples, we shall restrict to very minimal scenarios, scenarios with the least number of uh, free particles and least number of free parameters. And some of these scenarios may have uh, other motivations in particle physics, but that's not the angle from which we we'll discuss them today. So this is the uh, zeroth order uh, dark matter cosmology in one slide. Uh, there is an initial dark matter phase space distribution function uh, that is specified by whatever mechanism that populates the initial dark matter density. And given this initial phase space distribution function, the first question to ask is whether dark matter undergoes any significant scatterings. If the answer is no, then the next question to ask is whether it has any significant free streaming. Uh, if the answer is again, no, then we land up in cold collisionless dark matter paradigm, which is the C in the Lambda CDM model. And in that case, the density is related to the initial conditions, whatever specified this distribution function in the beginning. If it undergoes significant free streaming, then broadly there are uh, two classes. One is hot dark matter for which the free streaming is so large that uh, the largest uh, structures form fast. So structure formation is uh, top down, which contradicts observations. Uh, we know it's bottom up because we see galaxies at very high redshifts. Uh, so that is ruled out. So neutrinos would have been hot dark matter. Uh, warm dark matter is allowed as long as the free streaming length is uh, less than 100 kiloparsec or so, as I just mentioned. And in all these cases, of course, we end up in this box in which the density is related to the initial condition. On the other hand, if dark matter undergoes significant uh, scatterings in the early universe, then the question to ask, next question to ask would be whether it scatters with the standard model bath. If not, then there are only self scatterings, which may or may not thermalize. 
if they don't thermalize, we end up in the same box. If they thermalize, then there is a dark matter temperature that we can define, which is different from the standard model temperature. Now, if there are, in addition to this, uh, number changing processes uh, within the dark matter sector, then its density may be decided by the rates for those processes, uh, by thermal mechanisms, and uh, therefore it does not depend on the initial conditions anymore. Of course, if it scatters with the standard model bath and it thermalizes, then the situation is the simplest. The dark matter temperature is same as the standard model temperature, at least during some epoch. And uh, in both cases, when thermalization occurs, is the temperature and the chemical potential which describe the system uh, completely. So that's the uh, summary. And uh, so we end up in these three uh, possibilities and we shall discuss examples from each one of them. So let's start with the simplest one uh, where dark matter thermalizes with the standard model sector. Uh, I'll, I'll discuss two examples. Uh, the simplest example is of course, uh, dark matter being uh, the neutral component of a multiplet of the electric gauge group. This is simple because in this case, uh, once the dark matter spin and representation is fixed, there's only one free parameter, that's dark matter mass. And if you demand that this one particle saturates the observed density, then that mass is also determined. Of course, if it doesn't saturate the density, then you get an upper bound on the mass. If these particles are Majorana fermions, then the spin independent uh, scatterings with nucleons are loop suppressed, and therefore you require uh, multi ton scale detectors. Uh, and therefore, indirect detection uh, becomes an important probe for this. And uh, the most important ones are uh, diffuse gamma rays from annihilations to weak bosons. Uh, there are also gamma ray lines from loop induced processes with lower rates. Collider probes will be discussed by Shubhadito, but uh, this uh, case presents an interesting collider probe where you have a disappearing charge track signal from the production of the charge partners, uh, which undergo delayed decay due to the small loop suppressed mass splittings with the neutral part. Two famous examples, the SU2 triplet, we know, and the SU2 doublet, the split Higgsino. For the case of we know, the mass is around three TeV if it saturates the density, for Higgsino is a TeV. The loop induced scattering rate for we know is around 10 to minus 47 centimeters square, which as I said, requires a multi-ton scale uh, experiment, but it is feasible in the near future. For Higgsinos, the, the rate is uh, further suppressed by another two orders of magnitude, and it goes below the neutrino floor. Therefore, you need much longer exposure times. Uh, the current constraints from observations of uh, dwarf spheroidal galaxies, which are uh, dark matter dominated systems, high mass to light ratio, uh, using the Fermi lab data, a constraint uh, windows of mass around 400 GeV if they make up the full dark matter, and a small window around uh, 2 TeV. Uh, for Higgsinos is slightly lower. Uh, there is a recent analysis, uh, which just appeared a few months ago, which analyzed the 14 years of Fermi continuum gamma ray data, but from the galactic center. And uh, they claim that there is a, a small hint of uh, a Higgsino-like particle at a one TV with the cross-section predicted uh, by this SU2 doublet uh, interactions. And this is the summary of the collider probes. The collider probes are especially relevant uh, when they don't make up the full dark matter, so the mass is lighter. And uh, the 14 TV LHC, unfortunately, falls short uh, to probe the thermal regime, but a future 100 TV machine can do the job. The next simple example is uh, a singlet scalar field, uh, which, is, which has a renormalizable coupling with the Higgs boson. In this case, now we have two free parameters instead of one, the mass and the coupling to the Higgs. Uh, the strongest constraints here come from uh, dark matter nucleon scatterings, uh, and uh, inter detection is not as competitive here. Collider probes are invisible decay width of the Higgs if the mass is in the right ballpark. Otherwise, we need to go to off-shell Higgs. What's the current situation? We see that uh, the xenon one ton data probes up to a mass of about a TV. Uh, but higher than a TV, it is uh, still uh, consistent with the direct detection experiments. Uh, of course, as we go to higher values of the couplings, the perturbative computation will eventually break down. And that brings us to the natural question of how high can the mass of uh, thermal dark matter be? And uh, the answer is provided by the unitarity of the S matrix, which implies the optical theorem. 
uh, and that optical theorem in, in turn gives an upper bound on the inelastic uh, scattering cross section. And uh, using this upper bound on the inelastic cross section, you can uh, constrain the average, thermally average annihilation rate for any arbitrary 2 to k process. Uh, if the initial state is not a two particle state, which is relevant uh, when these number changing processes go on inside the dark matter sector, uh, then the minimal number changing process is a three to two one. Uh, then this analysis becomes somewhat more complicated because uh, the decomposition into angular momentum basis for a three particle or a four particle initial state is harder. But in this case, as we showed in this paper, uh, using detailed balance in uh, chemical equilibrium, you can convert the upper bound on the 2 to k rate to an upper bound on the k to 2 uh, rate. Okay. Uh, so the, the upper bound on the inelastic cross section will imply a minimum surviving number density for the dark matter, which in turn will imply a maximum dark matter mass if it saturates the total density. So that's the unitary upper bound. Uh, for S wave, uh, for 2 to 2 scatterings, it's around 130 TV. For 3 to 2, uh, it's a GV. So, uh, so that's the ballpark target for uh, thermal dark matter. Brief remark on the dark matter chemical potential. Uh, I mentioned that if uh, thermal equilibrium is reached, then the temperature and the chemical potential uh, determine the system. Uh, if we look back in the standard model sectors, uh, the baryons and electrons do have a small chemical potential. There is a baryon antibaryon asymmetry in the universe. The neutrino chemical potential is unknown. It's only weakly constrained. Uh, by BVN uh, by n minus two. So if dark matter had a thermal equilibrium history, then in general, it can also have a chemical potential. And if it does, then the relationship between the dark matter mass and the annihilation rate is modified, uh, right? Because if you just compute the total density of dark matter and anti-dark matter, then the chemical potential also enters. And in general, it is enhanced, the total density is enhanced for the same freeze out temperature. So the way the computation goes here is that you, there is an asymmetry generation process which generates the difference in, in the number density of dark matter and anti-dark matter from this chemical potential. And uh, so once that process freezes out, the difference in the number density freezes. Subsequently, there can of course be pair annihilations as is, is the case for baryons. And that can remove one of the components either partially or completely and the relationship between the dark matter density and the annihilation rate is modified uh, by this relation. So if you take the limit, uh, C goes to zero after making a small C expansion, you will recover the WIMP relation where it's inversely related to the annihilation rate. For complete asymmetry, in which case only the dark matter or the anti-dark matter survives, uh, this is the relationship between the mass and the uh, asymmetry. Now, as I said, in general, you need two processes, one to generate the symmetry in the first place and then to remove uh, the symmetric component. But uh, as we showed recently in this uh, paper, uh, if you have uh, a, a process like a semi-annihilation in which uh, two dark matter particles go to another dark matter particle and, uh, and a standard model-like field, then one process can do both these jobs. As you can see from this diagram, this process violates both the dark matter number and also it can remove the symmetry component. Uh, so uh, explicit computation show that uh, nearly maximal asymmetry can be generated within perturbative uh, couplings. Let's move on to the second uh, possibility where dark matter thermalizes with itself. So there are no significant scatterings with the uh, standard model bath. Now, if dark matter is a scalar, then it can naturally have self scatterings, renormalizable interactions uh, and annihilations. And if there are no significant scatterings with the standard model bath, then its initial density must be populated somehow. So maybe from reheating, for example. Uh, and if it is populated by reheating, then post reheating, if the inflaton is much heavier than the reheat temperature, then dark matter only undergoes self interactions, uh, which may lead to internal thermalization. So the properties uh, of the evolution of the phase space density is then given by this uh, famous uh, kinetic equation. And uh, you can take moments of the equation. The first moments give the famous number density equation, uh, the zeroth moment. And the first moment gives the evolution equation for the dark matter temperature. So this is a coupled system. And uh, by solving the coupled system, we can determine the dark matter density and temperature as a function of time. Now, of course, the initial condition of the dark matter temperature is unknown. 
that's the primary unknown here. And it's probably said by the heating dynamics if it is populated by reheating. Okay. Uh, simple example, a low energy uh, toy model where there's a cubic and quartic interaction of uh, uh, real scalar. Uh, you can also do the same thing with complex scalars. Uh, it leads to both elastic and inelastic reactions. The minimal inelastic reaction, as I mentioned, is uh, three to two. There are many possible ways that can happen. And if such three to two reactions happen in the non-relativistic phase, then uh, there is an interesting behavior in which the dark matter temperature uh, falls only log logarithmically with the uh, scale factor. Uh, of course, after this process decouples, it falls the usual non-relativistic one over S square behavior. Uh, so in this case, the primary constraints come from uh, CMB and isotropy. And uh, if the dark matter temperature is, um, if, if the dark matter is very light, then its temperature is restricted to be as low as 10 to minus three of the standard model temperature. Otherwise it will uh, disturb the CMB. And uh, uh, there's a weak constraint from BBN if the dark matter is relativistic during the BBN epoch, of course, uh, it will contribute to the neutrino degrees of freedom. Uh, there's an upper bound also uh, uh, in the sense, sorry, there's a lower bound on the dark matter temperature. And that comes from the requirement of the equilibrium of the 3 to 2 process. So if you reduce the temperature too much, then the number density goes down too much and there'll be no longer equilibrium of this uh, number changing processes. And then the density again will be determined by initial conditions and not by the out of equilibrium of these reactions. All right, so the uh, last uh, scenario uh, is uh, that the dark matter phase space distribution does not uh, thermalize. And uh, here, uh, there are a large number of possibilities. Uh, it's, it, dark matter can be produced by uh, mixing with or small couplings to standard model particles by reheating. A famous example is the uh, sterile neutrino, when uh, where dark matter, uh, sterile neutrino dark matter is produced by a small mixing to the standard model neutrinos by this uh, renormalizable interaction. Uh, it, another uh, very well discussed example is uh, dark matter production in reheating. In this case, of course, the distribution depends on the initial conditions of the reheat temperature and the duration of the reheating and the inflaton mass. So let's consider a very simple uh, scenario for reheating in which uh, at the end of slow roll, the inflaton just undergoes uh, damped oscillations around the minimum of the potential which we approximate as a quadratic form. And then that's equivalent, as you know, to a field theory of uh, massive spin zero particles with negligible velocity. So it's just the inflaton zero modes. And uh, in such a case, uh, taking the example of a single fermion dark matter, uh, which is coupled to the inflaton phi, uh, and, and the inflaton couples to the standard model Higgs for the reheating to the Higgs the standard model sector, uh, we can obtain the initial distribution function of the dark matter, which I indicated uh, earlier, just from uh, studying the uh, phi to shy shy uh, process. So uh, as you can see, uh, depending on the duration of the reheating, the distribution function has a shape like this. So the earlier the dark matter particles are produced, they are more red shifted. Uh, on the other hand, uh, maximum production happens near the reheating point. So that leads to this uh, shape of the distribution function. And the density is saturated uh, for a typical coupling, a very small coupling of 10 to minus eight or so. Okay. And uh, if, the, if you are interested in uh, light dark matter, then the inflaton uh, and the heat temperature also needs to be lower than the TV scale or so. Otherwise, of course, uh, the dark matter particles will be too fast and they exclude it as dark matter. So uh, one question that we asked in this uh, context is uh, that since in this scenario, the inflaton necessarily uh, couples to both the standard model and the dark matter fields, uh, can inflaton mediator scatterings uh, become important in dark matter cosmology for a lighter inflaton, of course. Uh, in this case, as you can see, there can be uh, different inflaton mediated uh, scattering processes, uh, dark matter pair going to dark matter pair, uh, the T-channel dark matter standard model scattering and standard model uh, pair going to dark matter pair. Uh, so the problem is uh, numerically challenging because we need to solve this integral differential uh, kinetic equation with the collision terms for these two to two scatterings. And what happens here is that, so this is the initial uh, distribution function uh, at reheating that I just showed you in the previous slide. If there are no scatterings, then this is just redshifted. If I look at the distribution function at a temperature of around an MeV, it's just a redshifted distribution. 
these on the other hand, scatterings do happen. They tend to populate the lower momentum modes more. And so, so the average velocity of the dark matter particles, for example, goes down uh, due to the scatterings. And that has important uh, implications uh, for structure. Uh, for example, at matter radiation equality, the average velocity can be modified by up to a factor of 40 uh, due to the effect of the infrared on medial scatterings. And that changes the free streaming uh, horizon by a similar factor. So if you don't include the scatterings, then this scenario may be uh, thought to be ruled out uh, by Lyman alpha forest data. But if you include uh, scatterings, it's uh, very much allowed. Uh, this kind of coupling will destabilize the infrared on potential. Uh, no, yeah, the coupling, the yeah, so, will be in the loop. Right, so the coupling is around 10 minus eight. It's very small. But that doesn't no. change the infrared. Right, because the square of the coupling is 10 minus 16. It, it doesn't change. You need a very small coupling to produce the density. Okay. So uh, time is running up. So let me uh, move on to the summary then. Uh, so I discussed dark matter production in the early universe and uh, there are three broad categories as we saw. One is that uh, it thermalizes with the standard model. Uh, there are very simple scenarios which are highly predictive and uh, widely tested and very much viable at present. So that's the message. For, uh, for the case where thermalization happens with the standard model. The second case is internal thermalization only. Uh, in that case, the initial dark matter temperature is the key unknown quantity, and that is constrained by cosmology. There are strong upper bounds from CMB. Of course, it cannot be larger than the standard model temperature, uh, but the lower bounds are rather weak. Uh, and in case of no thermalization, of course, the density depends on the initial conditions, possibly at the inflationary rate. So moving forward, as you can see, so there are so many uh, possibilities uh, uh, here. Uh, so the primary question in, in, in dark matter astrophysics and cosmology uh, is that whether there is any evidence to go beyond this uh, cold collisionless paradigm. Uh, for example, we'd like to know whether there is a small scale cutoff in the matter's power spectrum so far, we don't know. And uh, whether uh, there are any lessons from astrophysics at the galactic scales that can uh, tell us about some properties which are different from this uh, cold collision data. So uh, with that note, I think it's a good point to stop. Thank you. Thank you for this nice overview of dark matter in cosmoparticle physics. So now time for questions and comments. Uh, Shoto, thank you for uh, this nice talk. Uh, I have a question regarding this uh, sec uh, third possibility, perhaps, where you are talking about the possibilities of inflaton decaying to dark matter. So uh, the description is uh, also possible uh, without having an inflaton. I mean, the phi can be any... Uh, right, but that's uh, beyond my simple paradigms. It, it, it includes more particles than necessary. But of course, you can I mean, it's it not necessary that you have to connect yeah, it to have extra constraints because the inflaton coupling to the standard model decides the heat temperature, which I can constrain. Uh, so because I have extra constraints, it's simpler. Uh, of course, you can, as I said, I mean, in this case, uh, there are many uh, possibilities, uh, right? Uh, mixing with or small couplings to standard model particles. So anything, anything that has uh, small, uh, small couple. Isn't essentially couple. anything that has, uh, I mean, that right. is not uh, thermalizing with us. Right, but then you need to explain the density of that particle again. So the problem got is it, more got complicated. It, got it, got it. Within the simple scenarios, I don't. So for inflation, you know the other stuff. At least partially. At least partially. Things. The second question is basically um, about this uh, uh, first possibility that you talked about. So. Right. Uh, when you are constraining this 3 to 2 or 4 to 2 annihilation. So my question is, uh, is this, a, you mentioned also that uh, like, for example, if you have, yeah. yeah, yeah. So uh, uh, is this a, uh, is there a, uh, is this model dependent or no, completely no. model independent? So this is completely model independent, right? This is just from the ace matrix unitary. Okay. It's completely right. model independent and it's completely non perturbative state. Okay, all right. So it doesn't depend on I have a T channel, S channel, blah, 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 blah. Not even a statement in perturbation theory. Okay, no. All right, thanks. Yeah, so I had two brief questions. So one about this uh, self interacting case, yeah. can you, when you talked about the moments of the Boltzmann equation. So yeah. I guess you meant zeroth and second moment uh, because you want the temperature. 
So I, I call the zeroth moment the number equation, the first moment the temperature. So the, the first moment is the first power of p squared by three. Yeah. So if right. I include because more it's p, power, no, no, but it's p squared. So. Right, right. But so I mean moments in velocity. So p squared Correct. by three is velocity. So first moment. Is... Right, right. But you see, because in large scale structure, you will also take a p moment, which right. will give you velocity, bulk velocity, which right, in right. your case would be zero, I guess, because you're assuming homogeneous isotropic. Expansion. Yeah. So uh, this is the zeroth moment of the kinetic equation at zeroth order in the FRW background. So Correct. if you go to the first order, of yes. course, the velocity. So that was equation. actually my question. Have people tried to do something like linear perturbation theory in this model? Yeah, they did. So. Uh, uh, Julian uh, Legorges, uh, you probably know, they, they did the full analysis uh, mm -hmm. with linear perturbation theory, and this is the bound. I see, because this is coming from CMB power spectrum. Constraints. Right, and okay. here the scatterings are important. So it's a, so they have included it in class. Right, or something. so it's a collisional system, the pressure right. effects are included, there's a different sound speed and right. so on, so everything. And a second very quick question in your uh, nice summary in the beginning of the phase space distribution of possible dark matter candidates. Right. Uh, is there a space for these action-like particles, ultralight particles, or there fuzzy is. dark matter? There is, right? Where Suddenly, uh, they don't undergo significant scatterings, and they don't have significant speed streaming, so they fall here. Ah, and of course, how because... their initial phase space is populated, uh -huh. that's more complicated, but uh, they definitely right. fall but here. But you see, at the simulation level, these are very different from... Right, they're wave-like, and it's very different. Exactly. Right? Yeah. So there can be solitonic cores and so on. Rohini, would you like to ask the question now? Yes, uh, thank you. So thanks, uh, Satya, for a very nice talk. I wanted to ask you uh, about your finite chemical potential story. Okay. Can you go to that slide? Yeah. Yeah, I guess I all I wanted to really know is uh, this uh, C that uh, you have there uh, that's coming up, yeah. which is really the uh, asymmetry, you know, right. yeah. the, that uh, is generated. So the this is uh, that. So that is the only thing that depends on the specific model. Uh, that's right. So it depends. That's all on, right. Right. So so you, as you can understand, to generate this C you need CP violation in the model, right? So if correct, you look at the particle correct. physics, so, so, so those things will determine how big C can be, right? And uh, so, for example, I said that the semi-annihilation can generate the C and it can also eliminate the symmetry component. Mm -hmm. If you write on a simple model for the semi-annihilation, you can compute at one loop level what that C will be. And uh, I said yeah. that the maximal asymmetry can be generated. Uh, as, I, as I said, that that is the one that captures essentially the complete model dependence in that uh, expression. That's right. Uh, mm -hmm. As long as the uh, you have a complete asymmetry. But mm. if you don't, right, mm. then the pair annihilation rate also becomes important. Uh huh. OK. OK. So then I misjudged that. OK. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, OK, thanks. In the simple case, uh, the pair annihilation rate is not important because you have removed the, one of the components completely. Yeah. So large, but uh, otherwise it's a mixture of. No, otherwise, I have to keep that in mind. Okay, no, thank you. Uh, I have a, a very naive question. Uh, so, if uh, the uh, dark matter self scattering and uh, the DM scattering with standard model, if they are comparable, what kind of a scenario would that be? Uh, would that be closer to uh, to the first scenario or? So if, it, if it if it significantly scatters with the standard model, it will thermalize the standard model. So then everything will be decided by the standard model temperature, and if the dark matter has a chemical potential, by so that. the self interaction wouldn't uh, matter. That it can matter if the dark matter is light and uh, there are significant self interactions. There will of course be constraints from cosmology and astrophysics, extra ones. Okay. But as far as the density goes, mm -hmm. right? So it will be a competition between how big the dark matter self scatterings are and how big the uh, interaction with standard model are. And you can yeah, end I mean, up in a situation comparable. I mean, almost similar. Uh, uh, then, uh, what kind of thermalization? Well, then, if if they <laughs> if they're comparable, then you solve this equation with all those terms included, right? And then see what happens. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Right. Uh, do you actually have an empirical model followed by? Right. So the model is uh, discussed by uh, Morey. Uh, they have a model. So what's the potential? Uh, the lambda 
Probably, but I don't remember. But for, for me, the only important part was that near the minimum, there is a quadratic term so that I can approximate the thing by the zero mode. I don't remember. But the, the, the details of this calculation does not depend on how the slow roll part looks like, right? As long as I don't disturb the slow rollness. Right. So here, here the inflaton part is that it reheats to the standard model, right? So, so that's important, right? And it's the same coupling, right? So this coupling reheats to the standard model, and the same coupling appears in the scatterings, right? So, so it's not uh, arbitrary. Yeah. So the thing that does the inflation is something different. It's probably kind of like right. And that won't affect this, this, these processes. And that's the difficulty, right? I mean, uh, how do you? 